Good morning and welcome to week two of our live stream service. Before we start this morning, we want to say a huge thank you to every individual and family who joined us last week. We appreciate every comment and encourage you to continue to comment in our live chat. Say hello, greet your neighbor, tell us where you're from. We want to hear all about it. Thank you for your feedback from last week. We made some changes to our service because of it. Keep the feedback coming. We want to know and we want to make sure that we are serving you the best that we can. Don't forget to text your questions about the teaching this morning. It is live and Pastor Raja will answer them. So the number is right here. Today we start our Easter series. In this time of uncertainty, I cannot think of a more timely gift. To be reminded of his power and truth, his love for each and every one of us, it's an incredible sacrifice. In Psalms chapter 17, verse 6, it reads, I am praying to you because I know you will answer, O God. Bend down and listen as I pray. Let that be our prayer this morning. Last week, we will, just like last week, we will start with worship as well as a testimony as a way to prepare ourselves to hear from God. So please now join me in prayer. Dear God, I stand here welcoming Father, each and every person watching. But God, truly, I'm trying to welcome you. God, doing this welcome makes me feel uncomfortable, but God, it serves such a purpose. And I just want to honor you now, God, whether I'm in a home or in a church, Father God, in front of thousands of people or just alone, God, I just want to honor you. I think we all do. So Father, we just ask right now that you be with us. God, that you bless the worship, that you bless the service, that God, you just meet us here, meet us whether we are alone, meet us whether we're surrounded by loved ones, God, just meet us, be with us. We need you, God, more than ever, it feels. So Father, as we continue to worship and we listen to Pastor Raja speak, just be with us, God. Remind each and every one of us that you've never left us that you will never leave us, God. And as you remind us of this incredible sacrifice, God, just, I just ask you that we, we continue to glorify you through this struggle. For it was such a beautiful sacrifice, God. And sometimes it feels like we are truly undeserving. We thank you for everything that you're doing, everything that you have done, and everything that you will do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Welcome to UCC. Hey guys, my name is Gabriel Stone. I was asked to do a testimony video for this Sunday. Uh, my testimony actually begins at church. Uh, I found myself there seven days a week uh, because it also played a part in uh, my school. My school was held at the church. Uh, my mom and dad were on staff at the time and um, my dad was uh, an associate pastor. I can remember from a young age of probably third grade um, because my dad was a pastor, that's what I wanted to be. I can remember walking up to my room and um, just grabbing a Bible, thinking I know what it means, and pick a, a random verse out of it and picture uh, like a congregation in front of me and I would just go for hours, probably minutes, but it felt like hours. Um, but yeah, probably around the same time uh, in grade three, I remember things kind of started to go south. Uh, we moved away from the church um, which brought us away from friends, family, um, and a deep community, um, which kind of uh, played a huge role um, in my life and um, was very hard on me and my siblings. Uh, but life goes on. Um, so fast forward to about uh, fifth grade, uh, my parents sat me down and... Um, told me and my siblings with the trusted pastor that they were getting a divorce. And in that moment, it doesn't really matter what you say as parents. Um, all the scenarios that go on your mind as a child is, uh, it's your fault. Um, and you go through these scenarios of thinking, what could I have done better? What, what did I do that caused this uh, to happen? And um, my life was never the same after that moment. Um, it pushed me and my siblings apart, uh, pushed me and my f uh, parents' uh, relationships apart, 
Um, and I went down um, a, a road that quickly led to chaos. Uh, we found out that my dad had been unfaithful um, in his marriage, uh, which is why we left the church to begin with. Um, and then now, in fifth grade, um, we found out he had been unfaithful again, and um, that was it. That was the final straw. Um, in the years to come, I would quickly find my life uh, going down a road of chaos. Um, I'd be looking up stuff I shouldn't be on the internet. I'd be trying to cope with alcohol, drugs, and just as simple as hanging out with people I, should, I have no business to be hanging out with. Um, my life felt like I was, it was in shambles. Uh, I hit a breaking point. Um, in a moment that um, had condemnation, uh, guilt, shame, uh, hatred of myself and the choices I had made, um, I was met with the presence of God. Um, in my lowest moment, God was there. And trying to fill this void of my dad, um, God met me and he reminded me that he is the father who will never leave me nor forsake me. Um, in a moment of loneliness, God was the, the one who reminded me he is the all-present God. My life story is basically failure after failure and God meeting me where I am at every low point to pick me up and bring me back. Um, and still to this day, my story is not over. Uh, I fail every single day and um, he's still there. He still remains. He's still faithful. Um, and the call that God has on my life, um, there's days I feel like it's faded because I continually think um, that I'm disqualified because of the choices I've made in my past. Um, something Pastor Raja always says that, um, that I'm reminded by is, the first thing the enemy will say when you hear from God is, um, did God really say? And um, it's in those moments when you have to trust God um, and not your, not your thoughts, not the enemy, um, not your feelings, but you have to trust what God says is real. I've heard the enemy say this time and time again, um, but God is relentless. His love is greater than ours. His ways are way, way higher than ours. And his purpose is, and will is way stronger than ours. He who began a good work will finish it to completion. The stress is off and God will carry us. Um, I just wanted to finish with a verse that has been um, like a life verse to me. Uh, it's found in Psalm 73, verse 25 and 26. It says, Who have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Thanks.
Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our uh, UCC live stream. Uh, this is week number two as we keep trying to work through and trying to figure things out as I try to keep uh, staring at the camera as I talk and not move around and walk around. So uh, it'll be an adventure for everyone. You know what? Next week, I'm just going to attach a camera to my forehead and walk around the neighborhood just to see what happens. I don't know. You never know, right? Or maybe wear a dinosaur outfit. Anyways, good morning and welcome, and thanks for joining us. If you're visiting or if you are uh, just tuning in, uh, thanks so much for joining us as well, too. Um, this morning, we are going to start a new series, and our Easter series. You know, what's interesting is behind all of what's going on in regards to self-quarantine and COVID-19... Um, Easter is happening, right? The Easter season is taking place behind the scenes, and we as Christ followers, we as uh, disciples of Jesus have to remember that and kind of um, prepare ourselves for that. Remember, we looked at this a, a while back, but the word Lent literally means a, a, a type of preparation towards receiving and remembering and reflecting upon uh, the sacrifice and the, and the story of Easter. And so this morning, we're going to start a series called Eyewitness. Um, what's interesting about the Easter story is, is we get to view the Easter story through the eyes of a whole bunch of people. Um, so on the behind me is a screen with uh, my notes on it. So hopefully that'll come up and, and hopefully we'll figure it out. And if not, don't worry, we'll put a PDF in the notes there somewhere so you can actually access it later on as well too. And so what the Easter story is, is that what we have to remember is the early church, uh, when they wrote, when they, when they were trying to catalog the, their experience, it was from an eyewitness account. And that's what gives it so much power, but also diversities because it's through different eyes. Uh, I love that one quote from uh, the video you saw there by Jay Warner. It said this, a straightforward reading of the book of Acts reveals the apostles saw themselves as eyewitnesses. The early church recognized this and formed the canon around the historic apostolic record related to Jesus. So when we hear these writings, when we see um, the gospel narratives, we see the book of Acts, these are people writing firsthand accounts, which is kind of incredible when you think about it. As a matter of fact, we see this in uh, 1 Peter and 1 John. As they are uh, writing this, as they're writing their letters to the church, they are saying at the very beginning there in 1 Peter 5, 1, I too am an elder and a witness to the sufferings of Christ. And remember, John's letter is interesting. Remember, John is the last living disciple, right? All the other disciples have been uh, killed off by the persecutions, by uh, the different um, uh, um, uh, ways of, uh, of killing off the Christians there, right, with the Romans. But John's letter was written to a church, to the next generation that's growing up, who were not eyewitnesses, who were not actually, um, who had not seen what Jesus had done, not seen all the acts. And so when John writes his letter, he's trying to help this next generation understand, and he's trying to say to them, I have seen, I have touched, I have experienced this person named Jesus. And so what I'm saying to you is true because I have seen it. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 1, when he writes his letter, he says this, we saw him with our own eyes and touched him with our own hands. He is the word of life. So John is trying to convey to this next generation that what he is writing is from personal experience and personal testimony. Easter is amazing that way, right? The variety of eyewitness accounts gives us a robust picture of Easter. And that's what we're going to do for this series, is we're going to take a look at Jesus and the, the events of Easter through some well-known eyes, but also hopefully uh, some, some eyes you would not have uh, expected. And we're going to hopefully see uh, what takes place. One of the things I always notice is, uh, one of the things I always think about is, what would I have noticed? You know, Blockbuster may have died down on Earth, but I think it's in heaven still. And... Uh, in heaven, there's going to be an entire section of, of, uh, of the life of the Bible. You get to kind of pick one, right? And so what I always wonder is, what would I have noticed about Jesus? Would it be his miracles, his teachings? Would it be his appearance? We don't have any record of what Jesus looked like. Was he balding? Was he overweight? Was he, like, like we just don't know, right? We just don't know what Jesus looked like. And so what would I have noticed about this rabbi uh, from Nazareth? What would I have recognized or, or understood about him? And so we're going to take a look at that. Now, what's interesting about eyewitness testimony is that Eyewitness testimony is a legal term. It refers to an account given by people of an event they have witnessed. A number of years ago, I was a, a store manager at a high-end clothing store, and um, uh, what, what happened was is we had this professional uh, group of uh, shoplifters come through the mall, and they stole a whole bunch of uh, items from a variety of stores. And so we had a detective come from the police department, and I had never uh, actually spoken to a detective. You know, you see them on Law & Order, you see them on the cop shows, but you never actually speak to one. So I had a conversation with the detective, and I said, 
what are you guys looking for? Like, what are you trying to understand about all the stores, you know, the employees and people who were at the mall when, they, when this event took place? What are you trying to see? And what the detective said to me was actually kind of interesting. He said, what we look for is actually a variety of testimonies. If everybody says the same thing, we think that's kind of suspicious. It's kind of a rehearsed story. He said, when everybody sees, says something different about what the event took place, we know that's the truth. Because what people notice is always based upon their perspective and based upon what they say to be true. And so the eyewitness accounts of the Easter story gives us a, a, a really deep and, and diverse perspective on it. And what's so powerful about uh, the eyewitness testimony um, is that it is, it is the most powerful testimony. So whenever you watch uh, the legal shows or, or, or the detective shows, what they're always looking for is somebody who saw the person do the crime, right? As soon as the person says, I saw the person, they point across the courtroom and said, I saw that individual commit this crime, kill this individual, steal this item, right? The jury goes, okay, so there's an eyewitness account, therefore we can, we can believe it a lot more. You know, it's rather than the person saying, well, I heard about this, or I read about this, or someone mentioned this to me. You know, like, that's all second and third and fourth hand accounts, and that doesn't have as much uh, weight or uh, drama about it. But when someone says, I saw the person do it, you're like, oh, okay. Well, Easter is like that. This morning, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at uh, the life of Jesus through those around him. As a matter of fact, Jesus himself even says this, right? In Luke chapter 9, he turns to his disciples and he asks them an interesting question. Who do the crowds say that I am? That's kind of interesting if you think about it, right? Because Jesus talks to his disciples and says, this is who I am. And sometimes they get it, sometimes they don't. You know, the Gospels can almost be uh, renamed Adventures and Missing the Point, right? So Jesus would say something to his disciples, and they're like, you know, one time Jesus says to his disciples, you know, beware the, 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 the yeast of the Pharisees. And the disciples are like, does he want bread? Is he hungry? Should we order out? Should we do an Uber Eats? You know, that's where the guy comes with a camel, you know, and it takes a bit of time, but you get the idea, right? But so Jesus says to the disciples, who do people say that I am? Right? Like, how does a world understand me? How does the world reflect on me? And so that's what we're going to take a look at this morning. This morning, we're going to take a look at three individuals, three individuals who are very close to Jesus. And we're going to take a look at three stories about their interaction with Jesus. And from that, we're going to take a look at, see, how did they experience and how did they understand Jesus? In John chapter 11, verse 5, we get an introduction to these three people. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So Martha, Mary, and Lazarus were three individuals who had a very special relationship with Jesus. As a matter of fact, a lot of historians try to uh, wrap their mind around who these individuals were because the Bible gives us some details, but not a lot. One uh, commentator said this, we know little about the background of Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. They may have been well-to-do orphans who had the management of their own lives since there is no mention of their parents. Moreover, the eldest of the three, Martha, appeared to be in control of the household. So Martha, Mary, and Lazarus are three individuals who are siblings, but because they didn't have any parents, we didn't hear about their parents, we, we believe that they were just by themselves wealthy orphans because we know about how they lived, that they probably had a little bit more finances and more wealth than those around them. And it's also more likely that Martha was a wealthy widow who took care of her younger siblings. So when we look at uh, the, the life of uh, Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, so Martha would be the oldest, Lazarus would be the middle child, from what we believe, and Mary would be the youngest. So that kind of gives us an idea of who these three were. Now, what's more important about all three of them is that what we do know is that they had a special relationship with Jesus. You know, we don't know a lot about Jesus' friends. Uh, we know a little bit about his family. We have a couple of encounters written in the Gospels, but we don't have a lot of, um, uh, of, uh, of an account of their friends. But Mary, Martha, and Lazarus would be the closest we have to how did Jesus' friends uh, experience them or understand them. So we're going to take a look at three stories of interactions with Jesus and kind of see how they looked at them. The first one comes from the book of Luke, Luke chapter 10, verse 38. And Luke chapter 10, verse 38 says this, as, as Jesus and the disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, they came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Now, this is important, right? So Luke is kind of helping us to see this story, setting it up for us. And what's interesting is Luke is saying that uh, the place that Jesus is going is to Mary's, uh, sorry, to Martha's home. 
So which gives more credibility to Martha being the oldest and that this is, be, this is her home there. So the disciples pop in. Now, I don't know about you, but um, have you ever had a, a group of people just show up at your house? That's like almost unheard of, right? Like uh, you might be in your pajamas, or your track pants, like you just or may not even have any food, right? A, a large group of people popping by. Remember, Jesus traveled, we know, with at least 12. But there is also like uh, others around them as well, too. So we don't know how many people were uh, traveling with Jesus. But I think it's probably safe to say that about, you know, 15 to 18 people just showed up at Martha's place. And so what happens then, right? So if people just show up, you, you know, you try to figure out what you have in the cupboard to try to feed them. So that's, that's exactly what happens, right? But look at verse 39. And verse 39 says this, her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he taught. So Jesus comes to the home of Martha and uh, he sits down, he begins to teach and his disciples are there, uh, the household is there. And where's Martha, sorry, where's Mary? Mary is at Jesus' feet listening, which again has a whole bunch of implications. Uh, the term being at his feet is a, is a term of a disciple, is how um, the Bible uh, uh, classifies a, um, a rabbi teaching to some, like a student. So that's where Mary is. Now look at Martha, right? So Martha says something, and I think this is kind of important right? But Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, does it seem unfair to you? My sister just sits here while I do all the work. Tell her to come, ha to come help me. Now, I know that Martha gets a lot of flack for this, but I just want you to, I, I want to put you in Martha's shoes for a moment, right? Say, for example, you're at home and one day a, a world famous musician comes by your home. And the musician and his band come to your home, and what they do is they set up in your living room and they and they begin to play music. And this is like a, a, a band or a musician that has like thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of people who want to see them. And then rather than sitting there and listening to the music, rather than sitting there and, and hearing the stories that this musician say, you go off and you try to prepare a meal for them. Now. Obviously, you want to be a good host and you want to prepare something for them. But when does this happen? When do you get the opportunity to have this incredible individual in your home sharing stories, performing for you, listening? Well, that's kind of what Jesus is. Remember, Jesus is a well-known uh, teacher, rabbi of the time. He's, he's a miracle worker. He's a kind of a controversial figure. He, he, uh, he attracts a wide variety of people. And so he's at your home and he's teaching. Well, I don't know about you, but whatever I would have thought about that, I would want to sit there and I want to hear. Now, it doesn't mean I'm a, I'm a believer in Jesus. It doesn't mean I take everything he says for, at, at, at face value. It just means that I want to hear him. I, I want to kind of experience who this person is, right? But instead of doing that, Martha's off is, and being distracted. Now, because Martha would have been a wealthier, she would have had a servant or, or somebody who worked at her home. She could have gave those duties to that so that she could have sat there as well too. But she chose something else. So I don't want to say to Martha that um, this is not the thing you would do because I, I understand it. I love having people over. I love hosting people. And the thing you want to do is you want to make sure people's needs are being met. But I think that Martha is kind of missing out an opportunity to hear the rabbi Jesus, to hear what he has to say, to kind of experience him face to face. And so Mary's at his feet. Uh, Lazarus is there. We don't, we don't know where. And, and Martha's in the kitchen working out. She comes in and she says, and I love that phrase, doesn't it seem unfair to you? Whenever people say, doesn't it seem unfair to you, what they're really saying is, this is the rule of what is fair, what is right and what is wrong, and what is going on here is wrong, because I'm telling you it's wrong. It's almost as if she's saying to Jesus, are you not aware of what's going on here? Are you not uh, aware of what's happening here? Now, look at Jesus' response, because Jesus' response is kind of interesting. In verse 41, 42, this is what Jesus says. But the Lord said to her, my dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. There's only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken from her. Now, there's a couple of things I want to unpack about that statement there, right? So on the, on the one hand, G Jesus says to, uh, to Martha, my dear Martha. And, and, I, and, and you have to understand, I think that kind of indicates Jesus' uh, his, his, his love of Martha. Right? He loves Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Right, So he's not scolding her. He's just saying, Martha, I want to invite you to something deeper here. I want you to have this conversation. And look at the word worth there. Right, There's only one thing worth it. Like I said, if a world-class musician came to my home and whipped out their guitar or, or whatever it is or started singing, that's worth listening to. 
you know, I can order out food. I can get someone to bring food in, or I don't even have to worry about the food. I just want to sit there and I want to hear this, this person, this individual, you know, before it right? That's what's worth having there, right? So what Jesus does is gives a value statement to Martha. Like, like let's, let's, let's make sure you understand what's really important here. Let's make sure you kind of sift through uh, what's really important here. And I love what it says about Mary. Mary has discovered it, right? It's a, it's a great term. Discovering simply means that Martha, Mary has chosen what to do. Mary has chosen that, you know what? Jesus is here. The rabbi Jesus is here. And just out of curiosity, just whatever it be, I want to see what takes place. Now, remember, when Jesus would go out and he would experience, he would interact with people, a lot of weird stuff, a lot of crazy stuff would happen. One time Jesus is speaking and a person who is demon-possessed just leaps up out of the crowd and shrieks. And of course, everyone turns to look at this person. Another time, a person would uh, bring somebody who is, who is sick, who is late. Like, like, we don't know what happens when Jesus is around. Extraordinary things happen, right? And perhaps this is what Mary wants to see. What's going to happen, right? Jesus is in my home. What's going to happen? So she's discovered what's truly important. And I love the last part there, right? It will not be taken from her. Right? It will not be taken from her. Once you choose what is truly of value, it can't be taken from you. Now, the second story we're going to take a look at is, is it comes from John chapter 11, right? In John chapter 11, verse 1, it says this. A man named Lazarus was sick. He lived in Bethany with his sister, Mary and Martha. Right? What's interesting is that each of the four Gospels give us a different perspective of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. This is why we're able to kind of say, uh, you know, this is how we're able to kind of draw some information from them. Now, we'll look at verse 3, and in the ESV, it says this. So the sisters sent uh, to him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. Now, what's interesting about Lazarus is um, he doesn't say anything. <laughs> like, I don't, we don't ever have a conversation with Lazarus. We don't actually know anything about Lazarus. Like, Lazarus is just kind of a prop in the background, right? It's Mary and Martha that gets more of the spotlight. Lazarus is just there, right? And so Lazarus is ill. So if you were sick... Right and uh, right now with uh, uh, COVID nineteen, uh, people could be sick or people may be feeling uh, symptoms or, or whatnot. If you knew somebody who was a doctor, if you knew somebody who was a specialist in this field, wouldn't you call them up? Wouldn't you text them saying, "Hey, I have a sore throat. Hey, I feel this. What do you think?" Right? If you knew somebody who could fix or help you in this time, wouldn't you want to reach out to them? Right? So Lazarus is ill. Now remember. The Bible takes place in an ancient Middle Eastern context, right? You're living in a context where, like, uh, an infection can lead to death. So sickness and, 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 uh, and that type of thing is taken very seriously. And Lazarus is ill, and we don't know what he has. But Mary and Martha are like, hey, wait, wait, wait. We know Jesus. And, and remember, Jesus is the guy that was able to heal people in the most extraordinary circumstances, even to the point of people being dead. Right? So let's send for Jesus because Jesus loves us. We already know that Jesus loves them. So he'll come. Right? Jesus will come. Now look here in verse 4 and 7 because Jesus says something. And it's kind of interesting because it, Jesus is going he's gonna, to he's gonna use this opportunity as a teaching moment. So in verse 4 to 7 it says this. But when Jesus heard about it, he said, Lazarus' sickness will not end in death. No, it happened for the glory of God so the Son of God will receive glory from this. So although Jesus loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, he stayed where he was for the next two days. Finally, the disciples, let's go back to Judea. So what's interesting is that Jesus hears that Lazarus is sick. But rather than go right away, he says, you know what? We're going to take our time. We're going to go back when I think we should go back. And the Bible tells us that he waits there for, for two days. Now, let's fast forward to the home of Mary and Martha and Lazarus because now Lazarus predictably has passed on. And look what it says in verse 17 and 19. When Jesus arrived at Bethany, he was told that Lazarus had already been in his grave for four days. Bethany was only a few miles down the road from Jerusalem, and many people had come to console Martha and Mary in their loss. So what's interesting about that is that in Jesus' hesitation to leave, Lazarus has died, right? And so uh, now people, friends and family have come to Mary and Martha's home to console them and to mourn together. That's, that's what you do in times of loss and tragedy. And in that, into that time of loss, Jesus walks in, right? And of course, like, you would think that that might be a bit of an awkward thing, right? Because you didn't come when you were called, and, and you walked in 
perhaps, if nothing else, you could have been by uh, Lazarus' bedside as, and have a vigil as, as before he passed on, have a conversation, share whatever words of love and, 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 con- and consoling them, right? But instead, Jesus walks into a time of weeping and mourning. And so he walks into this. And, and now, you have to understand something here. I did a little bit of research here in regards to uh, what takes place to a body when it's dead. And so remember, Lazarus has been in the tomb for four days. So I, I, I kind of did some research on, on, on decomposition. Uh, not one of the, by the way, just don't ever Google that because you, you don't know what's going to come up, right? So within the first 24 to 72 hours after death, um, the internal organs begin to de- decompose. But after three to five days after death, the body starts to bloat and blood-containing foam leaks from the mouth and nose. Now, what's interesting is, remember, this is in a Middle Eastern context, right? It's hot. It's dry. So I came across Daniel Westcott, who is a professor of anthropology who specializes in, in decomposition, which, by the way, that guy's a guy you want to talk to at a party, right? You want to hear the stories he has to tell, right? But he says this, that heat and humidity really affect the rate of decomposition. And from my research, I found that, you know, that, that, that Lazarus, his body after four days in a hot, hot tomb, which is where they would have laid him, his body would have accelerated the decomposition. Now, the reason I say that to you is because that's, what that's what's in people's minds as Jesus walks in. See, Lazarus just isn't dead. He's starting, to, he's starting to organically fall apart, right? And this is something that the ancient world was very familiar with, right? Like, death for us today is displaced from us, right? It happens in hospitals. It happens elsewhere, so we don't experience it. And when it does happen, then... We have professionals who come in and remove the deceased. Well, in the ancient world, that didn't happen. So what takes place to the body, they're very familiar with. And so Mary and Martha and all the mourners know this. And so Jesus just walks back into the home, and and Lazarus has been in the tomb, right? He's been there for four days, right? And so just imagine what's happened to his body. So now watch this in verse 20. Martha here, she's the first one that hears that Jesus has returned. So when Martha got word that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him. Now look at this here. But Mary stayed in the house. This is kind of important, actually, because this kind of tells us what's going to happen here. This kind of really shows us a little bit of Martha and Mary's personality, right? Martha's the eldest, right? And for all you oldest children out there, you are the rule keepers. You are the ones, you're the first ones to go out and to do something. The youngest, and just so you know, I'm the youngest, um, we might be a bit of different, right? So this kind of speaks to uh, Martha and Mary's character. So Jesus comes in and Martha hears that Jesus comes in. So look what she says in verse 21 to 22. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask. Now, remember this statement because Jesus is going to test this statement of Martha in, in a moment, right? But now look what she says here. Lord, if only you had been here, I don't know about you, but there feels like there might be a bit of an accusation in the statement as well, too. Because I don't know. So remember, Mary and Martha had sent somebody to find Jesus. They found Jesus, and they asked Jesus to come with them. And Jesus says, no. So that person comes back to Mary and Martha. And Mary and Martha was expecting to see Jesus with this person that they sent to find Jesus. And the person returns to their home and says, he's not coming. And then Mary and Martha says, wait, wait, did you tell them about Lazarus? Yeah, I told them. Did you tell them how serious this is? Yeah, I told them. And he didn't come with you? No. How would you have felt? How, how, what would you have experienced in that moment? And then shortly after, this, the, that, the messenger comes back to you and tells you that Jesus has refused to return to your home, your brother dies. Like, like there's got to be pain in that. So when Martha first sees Jesus, Lord, if only you'd been here. Behind that statement is, like, why didn't you come when we called? Like, what was more important than us? Like, like what was holding you back from returning to us? Right? Like, that's an, I, I just want you to know, from Martha's pers- perspective, I think that's an absolutely valid statement. Like, like what's more important than us, Jesus? Right? And, and, and that's a great statement to say to them. But now she says this, but even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask. Now look at verse 23 and 24. Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. Now look at Martha's response. Yes, Martha said, he will rise when everyone else rises at the last day. Remember, 
Martha is many things, but she's still a devout uh, a Jew. And, and, and the Hebrews knew that resurrection was something that awaits everybody. Right? This is a part of the teaching of the Jewish nation, that, that resurrection. So when Jesus says to Martha, you know, like, like, Mar- like Lazarus is going to rise again, Martha's interpreting this as like one of those things we say, like when tragedy happens, you know, around the world, what's going on right now, people make, you know, posts on social media, praying for, right? Praying for, and if, for example, if it's in a city or a nation, like, like praying for the U.S. or praying for Chicago or praying for Ottawa or praying for Waterloo. I always want to kind of think to myself, what are you praying? What are you, what are you saying in that prayer? Like, what are, you, are you praying comfort? Are you praying healing? Are you praying a reversal of the trap? Like, what are you praying, right? So when, when, when Jesus says to Martha, your brother's going to rise, it's almost like a platitude. Like, Martha, I'm praying for you. I'm here for you, Martha. And Martha kind of takes it that way. She's like, yeah, I know my brother will rise when everyone else does. But now look at this, because Jesus is going to kind of drill down on this a little bit more. Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Now, just, just stop there. Martha knows that everybody be, will be resurrected at the end of all things. Or at the end of time, this is, this is the promise that's given. Jesus says to her, no, 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 Martha, I am the resurrection. Which, just so you know, it's a bit of a grandiose statement, right? Jesus is kind of hinting, I hold the keys to life and death. Right Now look, look what else he says. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Anyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this, Martha? This is a great statement. Yes, Lord, she told him. I have always believed that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who's come into the world from God. Just, just stop there for a second, right? Mary gets all the credit for sitting at Jesus' feet, but it's Martha who actually says to Jesus who he is. I have always believed that you are the Messiah. That, 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 in the moment, just so you know, is an incredible statement, right? The Messiah to the Jewish people was the Savior, was the one who was prophesied for thousands of years who was going to come and, and turn over and upturn all of the world. And Martha has just said to Jesus, I believe that you are that individual. Now look at verse 28 to 29. Then she returned to Mary. She called Mary aside from the mourners and told her, the teacher is here and he wants to see you. So Mary immediately went to him, right? So Mary, like, so Mary has been, like, like Jesus has arrived. And I got to say, I feel like Mary was angry at Jesus. And I want you to know something. I think she's absolutely right to be, right? She's absolutely right to be, right? Like, like, like this miracle worker, Jesus, the guy who did the most miraculous things for strangers, right? This is the same guy who, when he was sent for, said, no, not going to come. And the brother, your only brother, he dies because of that, directly because of that. Jesus stayed outside the village at the place where Martha met him. When the people who were at the house consoling Mary saw her leave so hastily, they assumed she was going to Lazarus' grave to weep. So they followed her there. When Mary arrived and saw Jesus, she fell at his feet. Remember, this is Mary at Jesus' feet. This time, first time she's listening to Jesus, right? The second time, it's different. Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died, right? So Martha says, Lord, why don't you come back? But Mary's, Mary's accusation is actually a little bit more pointed. She lays Lazarus' death at Jesus' feet. And again, I don't, I don't think she's wrong in this, right? I don't think she's wrong in this. Mary's hurt, right? Like when you lose a loss of, um, when, you, when you lose somebody who you love, when someone you love who's close to you passes on, there's an emotional reaction. And, and, and Mary is at Jesus' feet. And, and, I, I, and, and the people who are with her are listening. And she points at Jesus and says, it's your fault that my brother's dead. That's, that's, that's hurt, right? That's pain. That is, that is something that is very primal and I think we can all relate to, right? And so now, now look at Jesus, right? Jesus doesn't even answer. He doesn't even respond to this, right? Look at verse 34 and 37. Instead, he says this, where have you put him, right? So now she, he wants to go. Remember, the tombs that they placed the, the, the dead were separated from where the living live, right? It's for disease, it's for wild animals, it's all that. So Jesus has to travel now to where Lazarus is, right? It would have been outside of the village of Bethany. Where have you put him, he asked. This is Jesus. They told him, Lord, come and see. 
this is interesting here. Then Jesus wept, right? People kind of joke, right? The shortest verse in the entire Bible is Jesus wept. But what makes Jesus weep, right? What, is, what, what makes Jesus break down and cry, right? What makes Jesus break down and cry is the reality that humanity has experienced death and suffering and pain, right? Lazarus, whom he has died, um, whom he has loved, has died. And he's seeing Evan around him, right? Mary and Martha have accused him. And these are two people who are close to him, friends that are very close to him. They've accused him that it's because of him that his brother's dead. All the mourners around him are weeping and wailing. And finally, Jesus breaks down and Jesus, Jesus weeps himself. The people who were standing nearby him said, see how much he loved him. But some said, this man healed a blind man. Couldn't he have kept Lazarus from dying? You see the echoes of what Mary and Martha, right? Everybody's thinking the same thing, right? Jesus, the miracle worker, had he been there, he could have changed the outcome of all of this, but he wasn't, right? Now look at verse 38 to 39. Jesus was still angry, right? Because now he's fed up, right? Everyone's accusing him of the same thing, right? Everyone's accusing him of the same thing. Jesus was still angry as he arrived at the tomb, a cave with a stone rolled across the entrance. Again, this is going to be kind of similar to what Jesus experienced in a few, in a little bit as well, too. Roll the stone aside, Jesus told them. But now look at this. But Martha, the dead man's sister, protested, Lord, he has been dead for four days. The smell will be terrible, right? So what's interesting is, um, What's interesting is, is that uh, Jesus has, has just come to the tomb. Remember, remember I said to you that Martha is going to be tested. Remember, Martha says to Jesus, I believe that you're the Messiah, the Son of God, and God will give you whatever you've asked. So now Jesus comes to the tomb and he says, move it aside. What does Martha say? Mm. Jesus, we're glad you're here and we believe you're the Messiah and that's all well and good and thanks so much for coming. But that, I, I, I don't think so. It's as almost as if Martha's faith goes only so far. What did Martha say to Jesus? That God will give you whatever you asked. God will give you whatever you asked. And Jesus says, roll the stone aside. And Martha's like, mm, maybe, maybe this one, Jesus, might be a bit too much. Maybe this one might be too much. And so, of course, we know the rest of the story, right? The rest of the story is Jesus calls forth and Lazarus emerges from the tomb and, and the crowd goes nuts. As a matter of fact, when you read on in, in, the, in, in, in John chapter 11 to verse 12, this is, the, this is the account. This is the final straw that finally makes people decide that they want to kill Jesus. Now, there's one more story. This, there's the one more story about Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And this one's kind of interesting because this time we have three different accounts of this story. And they all say the same thing, but they all say it in a different way. So I'm going to show you this. In Luke chapter 7, verse 38 to 39, it says this. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him. So Jesus went to his home, sat down to eat. Now, look at this. When a certain immoral woman from that city heard he was eating there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. Then she knelt behind him at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet. She wiped them off with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. In Luke's gospel, the woman is identified. The only label put on the woman is that she was immoral, right? And you know the story, right? A rabbi, the teacher, this miracle worker, this holy man, comes to this person's home. And this woman who is immoral comes to the home and takes this alabaster jar. And we're going to see a little bit more about this alabaster and the perfume, right? But she takes it and she breaks it and she anoints Jesus' feet. But what's important here, though, is her tears. Now, just remember this. This woman is crying. Now, I want to say something to you. When we read the Bible, there's details given to us that we have to be aware of, right? We don't want to just read this going, oh, the woman's crying. Why is the woman crying, right? Have you ever asked yourself, why is the woman crying? She can come to Jesus. She can break the alabaster jar. She can anoint his feet. But why is she crying? What does she know? What is she experiencing that no one else seems to? Right? Now look at Matthew's gospel. Matthew's gospel gives us a little bit more of a time frame because in Matthew 26, remember, by the time you get to Matthew 26, this is the Passion Week now. This is the time when Jesus is about to die. Right? So when we get to the end of Matthew's gospel, we know that we are in the last days of Jesus. And in Matthew's gospel, it says this. 
While he was eating, a woman came in with a beautiful alabaster jar of expensive perfume and poured it over his head. The disciples were indignant when they saw this. What a waste, they said. It could have been sold for a high price and the money given to the poor. So remember, I said to you that eyewitness accounts, you have, you have different uh, perspectives on the story. So in Luke's gospel, what do they notice? They, woman, they notice that the woman is crying, and they notice that she's immoral, right? She's a sinner, basically. And in some translations, she says she's a sinner. In Matthew's gospel, they, 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 they tend to uh, navigate towards the expense Right? So the fact is, this alabaster jar, and in some translations it tells us that you could sell this perfume for a year's wages. So I don't know, that would be, uh, depending on, on what you work, let's just say the range could be anywhere from $40,000 to $100,000. Right? That, that's a lot of money for perfume. Right? And so what happens is she takes it and she breaks it, right? And upon Jesus' feet. So in Matthew's gospel, what they, they, what they hone in on is the expense of it. Now look at this, right? In John chapter 12. Now, what's important about John 12? Because in John chapter 11, what just took place? Well, Lazarus has just been raised from the dead, and Mary and Martha was there to witness it. So in John chapter 12, the story continues, and John's gospel gives us, it gives us a greater picture of this. John's gospel gives us a bit more of the story, but tells us the woman's name as well. Ready for this? Spoiler alert. John's gospel starts off with this. Six days before the Passover uh, celebration began, Jesus arrived at Bethany, the home of Lazarus, the man who had been raised from the dead, right? This just happened a chapter before him. A dinner was prepared in Jesus' honor. Mary served, I'm sorry, not Mary, Martha served, but she's a great host, right? And Lazarus was among those who ate with them. Then Mary took a 12-ounce jar of expensive perfume made from essence of nard, and she anointed Jesus' feet while wiping it with her feet with his feet and her hair. The house was filled with fragrance. So, pause. Mary is the immoral woman. She's the sinner. Mary is weeping. She is crying, right? Mary is the woman that comes in front of everybody and does this extravagant act of, of love and mercy to Jesus, right? So, in, 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 in John's gospel, he tells us, but What's important here, remember I told you that details are important? Six days before the Passover. Now, why is it important? Well, Jesus tells us in verse 7. Look what Jesus says, right? Because everyone's getting mad at Mary now. Mary, what are you doing? Mary, why are you doing this, right? Mary, that's such a waste. Mary, you're wasting money, right? Now, look what Jesus' response is. Jesus replied, leave her alone. She did this in preparation for my burial. Mary understood something that even his, his disciples did not know, that Jesus is leaving here and he's going to Jerusalem and he's going to die. Now, remember, this was no secret. Jesus kept saying to his disciples, this is what's going to happen, this is what's going to happen, this is what's going to happen. And his disciples were like, well, it's metaphorical. Well, it's not going to happen. Well, one time Jesus was rebuked by Peter. Peter's like, Jesus, forget that. Stop, stop, stop talking about that. You're not going to die. Jesus kept telling his disciples, anybody who would listen, that the sole function he came to this earth was to be the final sacrifice. Mary, after witnessing her brother, the brother she loved, raised from the dead, after hearing Jesus declare something about himself, Mary finally understands. So why is Mary weeping? Jesus, one of her friends, Jesus the miracle worker, Jesus the guy that gave her brother back to her, This is the man who's going to go. And I would actually say this to you as well, too. In ancient times, in rabbinical culture, in Jewish culture, when a rabbi taught, women weren't allowed in the room. It was actually, it was was a very male-dominated thing. Now, I understand something. We as North Americans, we as Westerners, we can look back at that and say, well, that's this, that's that. I get that, right? But what we can't do is go back to a first century ancient Middle Eastern culture and scold them for what is traditional. We just have to accept what is true. But what is interesting is Jesus allows Mary to be there to listen, which is, again, unheard of, right? It's unheard of. And maybe that's why Martha was in the kitchen because the rabbi's teaching women aren't supposed to be there. So therefore, she's going to be elsewhere to help out because she's not supposed to be there. But where's Mary? What I kind of get a sense with Mary is I think Mary, being the youngest, I I think she's a bit rebellious. I think that Mary might be a little bit more spunky in her character because she's there, right? 
And I think that Mary, it all clicks together at, at, in John chapter 11 for Mary, right? Jesus, who is this miracle worker, right? Um, I love how C.S. Lewis kind of says this about Jesus, right? Jesus, the world says many things about Jesus, right? And maybe you watching right now from wherever you are, you could say this about Jesus. Well, Jesus was just a wise teacher. You can say that Jesus was a historical figure. You can even say that I don't actually believe Jesus even existed, although there's a ton of historical evidence to say otherwise to that. But you can make all these claims, but one of the things we say at Uptown Community Church is before you make the Bible say something it's not supposed to say, first accept what it says. And what does Jesus say about himself? Well, we just saw in John chapter 11, Jesus says, I'm the resurrection. No human being in history has ever said that, right? No human being in history has ever crossed over death and come back to the other side to say to us, I've been now, right? You know, I can almost say to you that one of the greatest fears that humanity has is the fear of death, right? There's a finality to death that just, it, it just frightens us. It terrifies us, right? Because we don't know what happens after that. Jesus is the only person to say, I'm the resurrection of life. That those who believe in me will not actually experience death, but will actually be reborn into a life. And that's a whole different sermon series right there. But that's actually the very seed of Easter, because in this passage, in this story, Jesus is giving those, the eyewitness accounts, those people who are there, he's trying to give them a sense and understanding of who he is, but not only who he is, but what he promises. So let's kind of take a look at this here. Martha is the eldest, right? She's the rule keeper, right? Um, whenever I do premarital counseling, one of the things I try to do is I try to have uh, an understanding of the uh, couple's birth order, right? Oldest, youngest, middle, right? Like where are they in the birth order? Because where you are in the birth order actually speaks to your characteristics and who you are, right? So Martha is the eldest and the eldest children, they're the rule keepers. As I always say to my premarital counseling couples, I say the eldest children are the parent's first experiment, right? When you do something for the first time, when you make a, a, a dish for the first time, you follow the recipe exactly. Why? Because you don't know what you're doing. So if it says, you know, uh, two grams of this or four ounces of that, you do it, right? Because you don't know. But the second time you make the recipe, you modify it. Why? Because now you have a sense of what you're doing, but you didn't like this part, but you didn't like that part. So you begin to change the recipe a little bit to suit your taste. Well, that's what children are, right? The oldest child is a parent's first experiment. And oldest children, I am so sorry. Uh, your parents did the best they could. And, uh, you know, and this is why middle children and youngest children will never understand what the oldest children had to go with. And again, youngest child here, uh, you know, I'm the rule breaker, but you'll get that in a second, right? So look at Martha, right? Look at a couple of statements Martha makes. On the one hand, she says this, but even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask, right? Look at this other statement. I have always believed that you are the Messiah. This, this speaks well to Martha, right? This speaks of Martha's belief and speaks to what Martha's saying. But look on the other side there, right? Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you? It's almost as if she's chiding Jesus. It's almost as if she's trying to teach the rabbi, this Messiah, right? Like how small does she believe the Messiah is? But now look at this. But Martha, the dead man's sister, protested. Right? On the one hand, she says, I believe God will give you whatever you ask for. And the other hand, she's saying, well, maybe not that much. Right? It's almost as if uh, Mary's belief didn't translate into faith. See, Mary believed, uh, sorry, Martha believed all these things about Jesus. But I don't know if she was ready yet to put her faith in Jesus. See, Mary, you can make statements like, I believe Jesus is this, I believe Jesus is that. But it's not until that is tested, that question, that answer is tested, do we actually know if we, if we believe it or not, right? Right now, our culture is going through, our world is going through uh, something that's unprecedented. And what happens in these times of tragedy, in times of suffering, what we really are is exposed. Our generosity or a lack of generosity, our care and our concern or a lack of care and concern, right? Hard times reveals what we really are. And for Martha, that was revealed to her as well, too. Let's go over to Mary, right? Mary the youngest. She's a rule breaker. Right on the one hand, Mary sat at the Lord's feet, right? And Mary's discovered what's really good there, right? She knelt behind Jesus' feet and she was weeping, right? But now look at the other side, too. Mary stayed in the house. Jesus comes and she is angry at Jesus. She doesn't want to talk to him, right? And what does she say when she first sees Jesus? Lord, if only you had been here, right? 
And again, look at how Luke's gospel describes her, a certain immoral woman. Right? What I think is interesting about Mary is that Mary's curiosity didn't translate into transformation. See, I think there's a lot of people who, who like Jesus. They can call themselves Jesus admirers, Jesus uh, 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 onlookers. But there is a leap that has to be taken from that to something that's transformative. Um, I'm going to close here soon. Philip Yancey in his book, The Jesus I Never Knew. By the way, if you are in uh, quarantine, look for something to read. Uh, and if you have like an ebook or you can listen to the audio book, The Jesus I Never Knew is a fantastic book. But we'll love what Philip Yancey says about Jesus. He says this, when he lived on earth, Jesus surrounded himself with ordinary people who misunderstood him, failed to exercise much spiritual power, and sometimes behaved like churlish school children. In other words, Jesus allowed this. What I think is so amazing about Jesus is that he invited doubt and skepticism. You know, if someone believes something that's untrue about you, what's the first thing you want to do? You want to correct them. You want to say, no, 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 that's not true. Jesus didn't, right? Easter invites us to re-examine our, our, our conceptions of who God is and the lengths God would go to to show his unconditional love. I want to close with a past scripture I want you to think about. Uh, in John chapter 1, verse 12, it says this, but to all who believed and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. This is how John starts off his gospel, right? It's not enough to believe in Jesus, right? Martha and Mary, had some, to a certain extent, believed in Jesus, but didn't really accept the claims Jesus said about him. Easter is the story of believing and accepting Jesus, Right? And so wherever you are, I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what you're experiencing. I don't know what tragedies, whether it's COVID-19 or other things are going on in your life right now. Our belief is tested in these times. And from our belief, we have acceptance. And that acceptance is we trust what Jesus says about himself. Let me just pray for you before we have one more time of worship, and I'll come back to close things off. Let me just pray right now. Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you that in the good times and the bad times, you walk with us. Lord, I thank you for Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Lord, I thank you for their stories. I thank you for their opportunities to interact with you, for them to witness who you are. But Lord, what they teach us is that we can see you, but not really observe and understand who you are. Lord, I pray for each person that's watching this right now, whether it's watching it live or when they watch it in the future. Lord, I pray that they would understand, they would experience who you are. And not just experience it, not just believe, but they would accept Lord, that they would examine the statements you make about yourself, that you are the resurrection and the life. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would reveal yourself to us as we prepare ourselves for Easter, as Good Friday and Easter Sunday are coming, that we would, um, we would prepare ourselves to, ex to believe and accept the claims you make about yourself. Jesus, you have gone, you have passed over from death to life. And I pray, God, that we would realize that that is the gift that you give to us, your followers, today. I pray, Lord God, that we would realize that in Jesus' name. Amen.
Hey, everyone. So uh, one of the things we mentioned at the very beginning, LaShana mentioned that their announcement is that you can text in questions. We're doing this live because um, we just wanted to kind of give you guys the experience of having something kind of live for you. We pre-record some elements of it, but we, we, we do this live. So the question that was texted in, we had one question that was texted in was, uh, why doesn't the Bible not record anything about Lazarus? And I, you know what? I got to say, whoever you text that question in, great question. What's so interesting is that we hear so much about Martha. We hear so much about Mary but nothing about Lazarus. It's just like Lazarus is just a prop. And I don't have an answer for you because the Bible doesn't tell us. And what's interesting is in John chapter uh, 12 there, that's the last time we hear of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. They're not mentioned any again, again in the book of Acts. They're not mentioned anywhere else before. So that's the end of their story. And so why the Bible does it, I, I can't answer. I can't speak to that. But uh, a great question nonetheless. Um, thanks so much for joining us. We want to remind you that if you're able to... Uh, to support us at UCC, you can use the Text to Give app, which is behind us. Also, if you want to e-transfer, we set up auto deposit on e-transfer, so there's no more passwords. And you can just uh, you can e-transfer your giving to UCC, and it's at info at uccwaterloo.ca. Thank you so much for continuing to support us. We are continuing to meet the needs of people in the community. We want to do. Uh, we we are being told to people who need help in regards to grocery cards and all that. We want to continue to meet those needs, and we're only able to do so because of your support. So thank you so much uh, for supporting UCC. You can do it via text to give, or you can do it by e-transfer. But in this time of just uh, of, uh, of being uh, away from one another, thank you so much uh, for continuing to support us as we continue to um, uh, contribute back to the community uh, as well. Uh, also, one thing I want to mention as well is that uh, this past Sunday, we gave out uh, craft kits to the families of UCC. So we gave uh, kits of crafts for the kids to do while the service was going on because we want to engage the children as well too because UCC is all about the families as well too. And if you would like to receive a craft kit, if you're in the kitchener Waller region and you want to have a craft kit for your kids, please e email us as well too at info. And uh, we will get one to you. Uh, we deliver them on the Saturday, and we want the kids to open them on Sunday morning when the service starts. They can have something to do and kind of a fun experience because, let's face it, parents, you're running out of things to do for your kids. So uh, we want to help out with that. So if you would like a craft kit for your child, um, uh, just let us know that. You can email us at the info, and uh, we will get that out for you as well, too. I want to say a huge thank you to Rebecca and to Melissa for organizing that. And also, as I sign off here today, I want to say a huge thank you to uh, uh, Gabe, Tal, and uh, Ken. Uh, we are under five years, so we're, we're good. But I want to say a huge thank you to those three for uh, helping put this all together. They're uh, such an, a tremendous blessing. Uh, so I want to say thank you to Logan and Tim for worship and Samantha as well, too. Uh, we're so grateful for them. Um, if you have any feedback on our feed, our stream, we just want to do a better job of reaching out to you. Honestly, this is so weird for me to preach from a table sitting down. If you've ever been to UCC, I like walking up steps. Uh, maybe I'll, you know what? Next week, I'll preach from a treadmill. So at least I'm walking, but I'm not going anywhere. I don't know. We'll figure this out. But if you have any other thoughts or comments for us, you can email us or you can comment on our YouTube page. Uh, we want to we wanna engage you. We want to do the best job as we can to kind of keep our community together in this time of, of being isolated. Remember, we are isolated, not alone. Don't forget, every week, every, uh, every uh, mornings, uh, Monday to Friday, we're going to have a devotional video and uh, a, a devotional for you with the Isolated Not Alone. So please join us for that. Like us on Facebook at UCC Waterloo. Thanks so much for joining us. Let me just pray a benediction on us as we go about our day. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you so much that you are the resurrection and life. Lord, I thank you that when we truly believe and accept what you say to us, death disease, whatever it would be. It doesn't hold any fear for us because we know who holds the life, who holds the keys for life and death. Jesus, you do. And I thank you, Lord, for Mary and Martha and Lazarus, for their lives, for their interaction with you, for their perspective on who you are. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would protect us this week, be with us. Uh, Holy Spirit, I pray you would comfort us and give us wisdom and discernment as we are isolating. But Lord, I pray we, you're by your presence would help us to realize that we are not alone as well. Thank you so much for our time together. Now may the love of the Father, the grace of the Son, the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with each of us. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll see you guys next Sunday as well, too. And don't forget, on Facebook, we'll be engaging with you there, Facebook and Instagram. Thanks so much. Have a great day.